You know, usually about this time I have something planned out for an intro to the video. Usually it's something incredibly stupid that I, for some immature reason, find hilarious. Ain't got nothing this time. Nothing. <laughs> Two thousand was an up-and-down year for the Thief franchise. March saw the triumphant release of The Metal Age, but May saw Looking Glass Studios closing its doors. Warren Spector supposedly managed to move a good number of the staff over to Ion Storm, and allegedly a good deal of them were able to work on 2004's follow-up, Thief Deadly Shadows. Apparently it wasn't enough people, or maybe new direction in reaching for the console market took too much of a hold, because this game misses the mark by a country mile. First and foremost, understand that the game is not bad. It's really not. Even with its buggy mechanics and silly glitches and the jump to third person, it's still really a good game. Fundamentally, it's not a whole lot different, but a lot of implemented design philosophy sets it far apart from the first two. Different doesn't mean bad, and consolization isn't always a terrible thing. When the game is crafted with the same love as the originals, it actually opens the door for people to move back and see the predecessors, which is kind of what I've done here. It's a much easier game and it plays very differently, but a lot of what made the series great thus far is still present. It's just not the same and there's a lot missing. It doesn't entirely live up to the Dark Project and Metal Age, but it's far more than just good enough. Being that we're playing on PC and thus we hate the 4x3 aspect ratio, we went ahead and downloaded the sneaky upgrade mod. It's not just a single mod, but really a suite of mods to improve the game in many ways. It contains multiple options you can toggle to make the game more like the originals, including the Thief 3 Gold mod. That particularly named mod goes so far as to remove mid-level loading screens, keeping a singular flow that completely changes how the game is experienced, although hub maps still have loading screens. The other big change is it adds in fan-made briefing vignettes that replace the basic text reading, thus making it more true to the originals. It adds a missing layer of depth that just makes the game more enjoyable. So let's get this show started and we're gonna try to have some fun this time around. Ladies and gentlemen, one of my all-time favorite games, Thief Deadly Shadows. So we start off the game and the first thing we see is that this is now a third person endeavor. This change pretty much directs the entire design philosophy in the game and is one of the most jarring changes to the game. When playing with the sneaky upgrade mod, it defaults everything to first person mode though. You can change between the two in the original, but it's not as helpful in 4x3 since everything is designed for the third person perspective. Something I have noticed by the way is that modding the game to display in 16x9 has an odd fisheye lens effect on the game. It's not noticeable at first, but things at the peripheral edge of your vision appear larger as though they were closer. Just a strange note. So our basic tutorial introduces us to a family feud where we get the idea to steal some fat ass loot. We make our way to the Rutherford family mansion and we get our first glimpse of the major changes. Levels are much tighter, open rooms, corridors, and the overall maps are much smaller. The tightness of rooms is offset by our new ability to squeeze ourselves up against walls. On top of levels being much smaller, we immediately begin to see that level population and patrols have been scaled down a great deal. Patrols will confine themselves to small portions of hallways and oftentimes even to a single room. This causes the game to have a much lessened effect of figuring out patrols and working around them and we'll look into it a little bit later. So we get our lovely little opal and decide we're going to go ahead and pawn it and we're introduced to the hub map. It's quite frankly beautifully realized. It's like a living version of the town missions from the previous two games. Guard patrols are a bit more opened up and we even have to avoid guard stations. The city looks as it always did, just with an added vibrancy that comes with the focus on it. We can enter a good deal of homes and businesses to acquire loot, witness events, and even get some missions. And the city brings about another new change. We no longer provision before each mission. Instead, we sell our loot at fences so that we can then get the gold to go to other shops so we can provision for the various missions. So our regular fence sends us to a different part of town to pawn off the bloodline Opal, and our new fence gives us a message from our good buddy Keeper Artemis. He wants to meet and asks us to go out and snatch up a couple of items for him. We start to break into a bit of the world building here as we run into a fish monster that we decide to let out of jail and learn a bit about the factions and how they've changed. <coughs> 
First then came the Hammerites, having witnessed the Builder's wrath visited upon Brother Karras and his vanity, yea, did they set out an inquisition to root out the heresy of their splintered brethren, the Mechanists. But it did not come without cost, verily did their numbers weaken and their presence dwindle, and even the Builder's name carried less clout amongst the city. Undeterred and reforged by his hammer, they set forth to re-establish his name and to rebuild their presence. Lo, but it would betide them that the thief came into their midst, and sought he the builder's chalice, the very gift the builder handed down to St. Edgar that would give him the strength to smite his enemies. Yea, didst he steal it for the keeper Artemis. Them second treasures, we's beast takers, comes ye from the woodsy ones. We's pagans make see our names anew with them city head fools. Hammerhead's strength dwindles and besetting us newsy hideouts among them bricks to spreaders, leafers, and vines. Not bees, we's contented to sleep see beyond walls of old quarters. Diana bees takers, them park in hearts a city right under noses of hammerheads. Leafers, spreaders, and vines grows, and pagans' numbers rise. Makes ye monsters and poisons, and takers' cities, we's be. So's thiefers, bees, askers to invaders at sanctuaries, and seekers out them jackknow's paw, mummified artifacts of leafy lord. Be sees ye how takes ye them cities over, and changers it pagans do, raises monsters from man fools' bloods, and plants at all things greens ye. Make her city new for leafy lords. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'd like to thank the Academy. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Having reintroduced ourselves to the factions and stolen their most treasured items, we report back to Artemis, get to hear Katika read a very nice little prophecy, overhear some babble about some old compendium, and decide we want to learn more about some horrible shit the glyphs are warning us about. So we make our way down to the docks and board pff, the flying fucking Dutchman. <laughs> A ship filled with undead that docked itself and is the cause of the quarantine impeding our movements throughout the city. We learn that the captain took the compendium of reproach to a seaside mansion and we decide we're going to go ahead and get that shit. We arrive to find his pirate crew staking out the mansion after what appears to be awake and meet up with the widow Moira. Welcome back boys and girls to another adventure in the continuing chronicles of everyone's favorite cat bugger, Garrett Stabby Pants. Tonight's feature presentation, Widow's Peak. You must be a friend of Robert's, perchance. One really ought to recognize one's own guests, but the fog has been so thick lately. Would you, could you somehow find it in your heart to fetch me a glass of wine? The servants have forgotten. Ah, the widow wants some wine, does she? Well, how about this? And then how about I steal your fucking inheritance, you bitch? And then why don't we go for a ride on an elevator shaft? Will Garrett ever get that final score? Find out on the next episode, Brethren and Betrayer, or How I Spent Your Summer Vacation. I don't so much play an asshole Garrett, but more of a walking embodiment of all that is evil Garrett. So we get the compendium, but have to do some digging to find the key to open it. We find that an expedition to a sunken citadel might hold the key if you catch my drift, and make our way under the docks. There we find more than just the fishmen, but pagans and rat monsters as well. We learn some history about the fishmen and see how the leafy lord played a part in the history of the world. We get our key and we get the fuck out of there before becoming fish food or rat feed. A quick side note to bring up is that after our first two capers, the two factions have given us a chance to redeem ourselves in their eyes. They start off entirely hostile, but each gives us a list of tasks we can fulfill to get back in their good graces. Kill X here, shoot Y arrow there. Simple stuff that really on the first night out puts your faction standing at full if you take the whole five minutes to do it. So now that we have the compendium and the key to open it, we get to hear Katika read from it. The prophecy is vague and we decide that to jumpstart it, we need to go all Taliban on the city and bring down the clock tower. Not the brightest of plans for minimizing casualties, but Garrett's not just a dick, he's practically insane. We bite off a little more than we can chew and Katika winds up dead. Orland, in all of his dick fuckery, is the only one who can see we're a cartoonishly evil terrorist from a PG-13 action film and decides that we're the one who did it. A small faction of keepers are on our side and helps us avoid the psychic assassins and gives us some info on where we can look to get to the bottom of things. Oh, and um, Artemis has gone missing for some reason. So we decide we're going to break into the library and the keeper's compound to find incriminating evidence. What we find instead is that Artemis has in fact gone full AWOL, Orland is a fucking retard, and some horrible old lady is animating statues to wring our little neck. So let's recap. 
Friend is on a bender and no one has seen him for days. Total Dick turns out to be totally incompetent. And Grandma is now trying to kill us. Yep, that's a Necro Swanson Friday night if I've ever seen one. So we seek out a gentleman that we heard about back at St. Edgar's Church. A triple threat, Hammerite, Watch Inspector, and Songwriter. Inspector Drett. He tells us about how King Diamond drove his grandma crazy, and now she's stealing people's skin and shit, and we need to get to the old orphanage to get to the bottom of things. And now comes the most memorable part of any game ever. I'm 28, and even when recording this gameplay, having completed this segment countless times, the Shale Bridge Cradle still manages to pull random shit that scares the piss out of me and makes me walk away from the game. Genuinely unsettling, horrendously terrifying, and creepy as fuck. We don't just have to deal with unkillable monsters from the Tool videos, we also have to go into the past with the aid of a creepy disembodied ghost girl voice and enter the nightmarish memory of the orphanage slash insane asylum itself. Creepy as fuck. So we figure that the girl we helped looks disturbingly similar to Translator Gamal, Katika's assistant. We free the ghost, follow it to where its body is hidden, and find a tomb sealed with glyphs. We remove the glyphs, and it turns out Gamal was grandma all along. She murders the living fuck out of people and goes on a rampage. Yes, in that order. It was at this point in my playthrough that I was reminded of a fun mechanic. If you die before I think it's day 8 in the main map, either by jumping into water or being mauled by a guard, you go to prison! Once in prison, you have to escape, but if you die in the map afterwards, you die for real. It's a fun little side mission that adds some extra life to the world. So my failing to look before I leap aside, we meet back up with our keeper buddies and decide to go to the old folks home and see if we can't figure out what Granny's up to. We find a way to kill the statue men, recover the artifacts she stole, and get an idea about a mystical final glyph and what we need to do to activate it. Some keepers, including Grandma Gamal, want to destroy it. But we meet up with faithful wingman Artemis in the lair and decide... We need to activate that bitch instead. But first, we have to pull off one last heist before George Clooney's career goes tits up and we have to get some artifacts from the museum. We go back and we run into our old friend the Eye. He taunts us and whispers and he's even more fun than the last time we met him. Having finished Ocean's Garrett, we're suddenly met first by Artemis, then Orland, and then it turns out that Gamal killed Artemis and is wearing his skin and is now killing Orland. We learn this through the age-old method of it's happening right in front of us, and we set out on our last mission, activating the final glyph. We take our artifacts to the monuments around the city, position them properly, and activate that shit, wiping glyphs from the world and defeating Gamal. Wait, what the fuck? We get rid of the glyphs? The Keeper compound becomes revealed for all to see, Keeper magic disappears, and Gamal is reduced to a sad granny. We faff about and end the game the way Garrett's story began. Hooray! Off the bat, story and lore are explored a great deal more and the world has a greater depth of life to it. We see the changes that our actions bring about and Ambience creates the feel of a world that is very much alive. Ambience is beautifully crafted this time around, varies heavily and is incredibly prevalent. The differences in level design and audio design create heavy atmosphere and differing tones between levels. This is probably where design philosophies of atmosphere really shine through for crafting mood. In my opinion, it is the most beautiful to look at, to listen to, and experience through interaction. A weird quirk of mine to know is that I don't look up a whole lot in third person games, and this game's designs really don't do a whole lot to dry your eyes up. But playing the game entirely in first person completely changes how you look around. You don't have a pulled back camera, so you have to be a lot more active in surveying your surroundings. The game plays just fine in third person, but to get a real feel of scale and taking in all the aesthetic, you really have to play in first person. So earlier we mentioned the lesson patrols, and they are a great deal slowed down. Never really having to absolutely deal with more than one guard at a time unless there's some random event going on, the game actually allows you to play a lot faster and it really breaks a lot of the concepts of stealth. I spent a lot of time running and was almost never penalized for it. The game plays entirely differently due to the handling of patrols and enemy AI seems to be heavily gimped this time around. Speaking of looking up in verticality, there is very little of it. Maps don't take you as high and you don't get rope arrows as a result. You get gloves for climbing brick walls, but you rarely ever use them for anything other than entering a mission or grabbing hidden arrows and loot. Levels being more closed off and the toning down of verticality means that you never get very high and there's always stairs or a ladder to get there. Equipment is roughly the same. Gas mines, arrows and bombs, flash bombs, assorted arrows, no water breathing or invisibility potions, and that flows into the biggest issue that comes to this game's detriment. Yes, consolization. 
This game's design is heavily influenced to be played on a console, as indeed it came out on the original Xbox. The hub maps means that there is less room on the disc for mission maps. To compensate, verticality is heavily reduced to the point of non-existence, missions are much shorter, patrols are lessened, there is no real infiltration, and swimming is gone entirely. It just feels like a game built on compromises more than anything else. Using your blackjack has been overhauled as well. Before knocking someone out, Garrett has to ready it, and you can usually initiate an attack within the first few frames of animation, but it makes the entire act just too finicky. You can threaten citizens with your dagger to force them to drop their loot, but with daily respawning loot locations and simply playing the game, it's more just a gimmick than a necessity. I really only stole from citizens for random time filling between running. It misses the mark and by a very wide margin. World design, story, lore, aesthetic, and atmospheric crafting are all there. But mechanical changes, many of it rife with bugs, smaller levels, and a complete lack of verticality, all come together to make a game that is 50% absolutely fantastic and 50% frankly lackluster. It's not the worst way to end the trilogy, but it's not even within spitting distance of being one of the best ways to end it. It sits somewhere between satisfyingly adequate and genuinely good enough. And that all depends on your personal preference. Not bad, but not what we have come to expect from the gameplay aspect. <sighs> I love the game, I truly do, and as far as the series goes, it's well worth playing. It's much shorter, so it's much easier to do subsequent playthroughs. I always wanted to see more, and long before the Endless Solus sequels began, I had hope. And I never could have guessed that they would make another. If you told me in 2004 that a new one would come some 10 years later, I would have been ecstatic with anticipation. It's a high note we leave this game on for sure, but what's coming will turn that bittersweet into flat-out sour. I'm the Necroswanson. You know what to do.